Okay, recording is on. Okay. Microphone is okay. <sighs> okay, so hello everybody. Um, apologies for the delay in starting. We had some technical difficulties. Um, first of all, great to be here. Uh, thank you all for attending and thanks to the organizers. Uh, my name is Callum McPherson. I work for Continuum in the uh, ticket team, um, so mostly a software position. And yeah, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, Ticket, our software package, as well as a very brief overview of some quantum algorithms. So I'll start with some slides and then I will move to uh, some Jupyter notebooks to show, walk you through uh, a tutorial with how to use Ticket. Um, and I will also have a brief section on Grover's algorithm. Uh, you should have been sent around a link to our GitHub repository. Um, this contains the notebooks, so you can follow along with me uh, later after my slides are finished. Um, yeah, uh, I should say if there's any questions, um, yeah, feel free to interrupt um, and ask me for clarification. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> Get started. Oops. So, um, just as a brief recap, it's maybe worth um, um, thinking about why we're interested in quantum computing in the first place. So, in short, the reason we're interested in quantum computing is because there are specific problems where we uh, can argue that quantum computing offers a computational advantage over standard classical computing. So there are several well-known examples of this. Uh, the first uh, is Shor's algorithm, which provides a near exponential speed up for um, prime, uh, for factoring, uh, and this is relevant to RSA cryptography. Uh, there's Grover's algorithm, which I'm going to talk about a bit, which provides a, a quadratic speed up for um, various unstructured search problems. Uh, there's also several applications in uh, quantum chemistry and material science. People have thought about uh, quantum computers as potentially useful for drug discovery and for finding new materials. And there are other applications which I'm not going to focus so, so much on, but these include machine learning and various combinatorial optimization forms. Um, so here's an example of a quantum algorithm. Uh, this is uh, um, called the variational quantum eigensolver. This is an example of a hybrid variational algorithm. Has someone been familiar with these before? Uh, okay, I see <laughs> one, maybe two hands. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically um, the way this algorithm works is that you prepare some quantum state and this uh, quantum state is parameterized um, and then um, you calculate some cost or some expectation value uh, based on the quantum state. And then you wrap this up in a, a optimization loop and try and find uh, parameters which maximize or minimize the value of the cost. So this is a hybrid uh, quantum classical algorithm. Uh, this happens to be something that's fairly uh, near term in terms of what we can achieve on uh, the quantum computers we have today, um, but it has many disadvantages as well, which uh, <coughs> makes it uh, challenging to extract an advantage from these sorts of approaches. Um, a sort of example of a classic uh, or textbook quantum algorithm is uh, Grover's algorithm. So, um, as I said before, uh, Grover's algorithm uh, solves unstructured search problems and can achieve a uh, quadratic um, uh, speed up uh, searching an unsorted database. Um, but this is also challenging to implement as the circuits needed uh, to perform this algorithm are very, very large. So we have uh, a quantum circuit here. We prepare a superposition of all of our, uh, all of our states. And then we have this uh, black box oracle here, which marks the entry of the database that we're interested in. And we perform this kind of averaging uh, procedure. Uh, and we repeat these two steps iteratively. 
and then we amplify the probability of measuring uh, the desired answer. So apologies that, that was quite uh, brief. Uh, so yeah, um, here is um, a sort of pictorial description of what's going on in uh, Grover's algorithm. So we start with a, a uniform superposition of all states. We're interested in this particular state, uh, W. Uh, so this is some entry in our database. Uh, so uh, we assume that we have access to some black box, this Oracle function, which uh, applies a minus sign uh, to the state that we're interested in and leaves all the other states alone. So you can see that after we apply this Oracle, um, we have all of our basis states as usual, and the basis state that we're interested in is reflected across the, the x-axis. Um, then I can um, perform the next step, which is kind of an inversion around the, this average line here. Uh, so then uh, this state is then reflected back across uh, the x-axis. And if I repeat these two steps over and over again, this um, basis state is going to get um, a larger and larger amplitude. And so uh, if I measure that state, then I will um, get the right answer with higher probability. So that was a very brief overview. Uh, I will go into some practical examples a bit later on. So if this is a bit unclear, uh, then uh, hopefully that's okay. Um, so now I'll talk about uh, quantum software. So um, there's already quite a lot of quantum software that exists for various purposes. Um, so I'm going to make a distinction between what we might call the system software uh, uh, of quantum computing and the application software. So system software is the stuff we need to actually run things on quantum computers. An application software is software that could be use useful for uh, various applications we might want to explore with quantum computers themselves. Uh, so under system software, we have um, quantum compilers, uh, Ticket is a quantum compiler. It takes some high level representation of a program that's understandable by humans and transforms that program onto something that can run on the real device. Um, we also have uh, online services. So Amazon um, has offered uh, web access to real quantum computers through uh, AWS. Um, Microsoft is something similar with Azure. Um, under system software, we also have uh, packages uh, uh, related to quantum error correction and error mitigation to try and improve the reliability of quantum computers. Um, one of these is <laughs> called uh, Kermit, which is a pun, and uh, you might be using uh, Kermit later on in the hackathon um, as well. And finally, there are like actual pro uh, special purpose programming languages uh, based around uh, quantum computing. A uh, well-known example is Microsoft's Q Sharp, for instance. Uh, under application software, we have um, libraries for quantum chemistry, like um, in Quanto, which is a chemistry package by Quantinium for uh, computational chemistry. Uh, there's packages for machine learning, uh, like penny lane, and other other application based packages. Uh, I'm going to have a brief interlude on quantum hardware. Um, I assume you've heard a bit about this already. Um, so currently, uh, there are many games in town when it comes to the physics of quantum computers. So uh, one approach is to use uh, trap tiles, uh, like we have a uh, Quantinium, uh, along with other uh, companies like IMQ and AQT. Uh, but there are also plenty of companies looking at uh, superconductors like IBM and Google, Bugatti, and so on. And there's uh, this isn't an exhaustive list at all. There are many uh, different approaches to quantum computing that use different uh, physical systems to realize the qubits. In a way, I think this is quite good because if you're not quite sure how to scale something, it's good to have many different approaches uh, attacking the problem in parallel based on different physics. Um, so what are some challenges um, that we might face with quantum computing? Um, I guess, firstly, um, the issue is that we don't have 
enough qubits for many of the most exciting applications. For instance, Shor's algorithm uh, requires uh, very large circuits to implement and also uh, requires quantum error correction codes, which uh, leads to a very large number of qubits you need for any practical use of Shor's algorithm. And the qubits we do have uh, are subject to uh, lots of uh, complex quantum noise. Uh, currently, we don't have the capability to uh, run error correction schemes at uh, scale uh, to correct these errors. So we have to make do with uh, a lot of noise uh, that corrupts the results of our computation. Um, another detail I want to emphasize is that quite often the performance of quantum algorithms depends on a lot of like low level implementation details. So um, if you have a, a large circuit, more noise will accumulate over the course of your computation and um, degrade your results. But there's also um, the connectivity of the device um, and various other um, details we need to consider um, when thinking about quantum algorithms. So um, you can access uh, quantum computers uh, through IBM. Um, here I've just gone to my IBM quantum account and asked it to show me a real device. So this is a schematic of the IBM Guadalupe device, I believe. So this is a graph and this shows how the qubits are laid out on the real device itself. We also have some um, information about the various error characteristics of our real device. So we have um, <laughs> this uh, C naught error, which is the error associated with the following two qubit gates. This turns out to be quite important metric. Um, but importantly, we can only have uh, these two qubit gates between nearest neighbor nodes of our uh, device. Um, so some compiler will have to solve for the constraints of uh, this nearest neighbor interaction. Um, so yeah, what I'm trying to emphasize is that there's a large difference between the high level uh, description of algorithms in textbooks and the sort of low level uh, details of uh, real experiments on hardware. Um, so just to um, give you an example, um, this is a circuit that I drew earlier. This uh, circuit forms the quantum Fourier transform. Um, so here um, I have this, uh, I have these Hadamard gates, which are single qubit gates, and I have these uh, two qubit gates, these controlled unitary interactions acting between my qubits. And you can see that um, my qubits that are in, uh, I have all possible pairs of interactions between uh, my qubits. So if you can think of this as, uh, uh, oops, sorry. You can think of this as um, a complete uh, connectivity graph. So uh, all of my qubits are talking to each other. And if I compare this to the topology of the device itself, um, the topology is much sparser. So I've uh, only got nearest neighbor interaction between these five qubits. So uh, some compiler will have to solve for the constraints of the device before I can run this circuit on uh, a real uh, on a real quantum computer. Um, this device only also has a limited gate set, so I need to translate my circuit into a gate set which my device understands. And in doing so, hopefully I don't introduce too much additional error into my computation. And so here I have shown an example of uh, the circuit once it has been compiled to um, the real device. And you can see that uh, now um, each qubit is assigned to a physical node of the device itself and my circuit is in the IBM gate set and uh, has only nearest neighbor interactions between the nodes. Uh, it might look like this is not a nearest neighbor interaction, node one is connected to node three, but if I look at the graph uh, I see that uh, node one and node three are uh, nearest neighbors. Um, so now, uh, after that introduction, uh, firstly, are there any questions uh, on what I've presented so far? 
Okay, I'll move on. So what is Ticket now? Uh, Ticket um, is our software library. Um, it's developed by us at Continuum, but it's fully open source. It is a high performance uh, compiler for quantum circuits. Um, so um, it's fully open source, so you can visit us on GitHub. Um, it's also um, has the property of being so-called hardware agnostic, which is a strange term, but basically means it doesn't make any fundamental assumptions about the kind of quantum device that you want to run your circuit on. So it can target a wide range of um, quantum hardware platforms. And an additional bonus is that it's compatible with a lot of other popular uh, software libraries in the ecosystem. So if you're familiar with Kiskit or Circ or Penny Lane, you can use Ticket in conjunction with those tools uh, they're sort of complementary. Um, so you can in install Ticket, which I would uh, encourage you to play around with. Um, you just install this with the PEP package manager. So uh, PEP install uh, PyTix. And there is a separate command for the different extension modules. Oops, sorry for the change in slide color. Um, so how does Ticket uh, structure? Um, so Underneath uh, Ticket is a uh, high performance C library. Uh, this ensures that uh, we have an efficient implementation and that we can rewrite uh, circuits uh, uh, with good runtime performance. Uh, we then have a Python interface, which is uh, PyTicket. This is what you install. Um, and this is um, hopefully more user friendly than writing everything in C. And then we have different extension modules to interface with different software and hardware platforms. So we have um, extensions to interface with Kiskit and Cirque and Penny Lane, uh, like I said. So you can build your circuits in any of these uh, software libraries and then uh, convert them to Ticket uh, um, and target um, any um, quantum device which we have an extension for. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of extensions. We have several more. So you can just um, run your uh, circuits on a continuum ion trap device or um, an IBM superconducting device or whatever you like. Okay, so that wraps up my slides. Uh, I'll now get into the notebook section. Uh, are there any questions so far? No? Uh, yes. So how does it make simulation more efficient? I understand that there's devices that. Yeah. Uh, so it does it like find lossy transformations if we have made the certain. Um, so when you're talking about circuit optimization, the main benefit is it, that it improves performance in the presence of noise. Uh, so if you're doing like a noiseless uh, simulation where you don't model the, the device noise that's present. In a real device, then you might not notice much difference from circuit optimization. Um, if you think long term, perhaps a compiler could minimize the depth of the circuit, so the overall runtime of the computation could be improved. Um, but yeah, for noise simulation, uh, I think the main benefit of uh, optimizing compilers is for noisy um, simulation and for experiments on real devices. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Okay, so now I'll open up my notebook. You bear with me. So, okay, so these notebooks, um, I have two notebooks and they should both be in the GitHub repository uh, that you were linked. So feel free to follow along uh, or not. You can just watch me uh, do it. For um, okay, so I'm going to talk you through how to build basic circuits in Ticket. Um, so uh, to build a circuit, we create an instance of this circuit class here. Um, oh, I, should, I should say, is everyone fairly familiar with Python or is there, um, have most people used Python before or do you, yeah, I'm going to assume that you know what to do is so, I can follow this, but okay. Uh, there's also a cheat sheet going around that uh, should be helpful. <laughs> um, okay, so um, to build a circuit, we uh, create an instance of this um, 
circuit class here. And then we can uh, build our circuits by adding gates uh, sequentially. So we can um, add a uh, Hadamard to the first uh, qubit. Um, circuits are zero indexed, so we add it to the zero qubit. Then we can perform a controlled X interaction between the, the zero and the first uh, qubit here. Uh, and then we can draw a nice picture of our circuit. Uh, so it will look something like this. So we have this circuit render here that's interactive and we can uh, swap between different visualizations or we can display in dark mode, whatever. So it's gonna be quite useful. Uh, so yeah, this this, this uh, circuit uh, builds a uh, uh, entangled bell state and we can verify this by simulating our circuit on this uh, very simple state vector simulator we have here. So um, I import this uh, air state uh, backend from um, one of the extensions, and then I can just execute my uh, circuit. Uh, uh, it will do some matrix multiplication, and it will give me this the quantum state that comes out of this circuit. So here I have some uh, state vector as a numpy array. And these are my amplitudes of my state vector. So if we compare this with our um, with our bell state, we can see that this um, matches um, what we expect from this circuit. It's just an entangled state uh, with equal uh, amplitudes in the, in the zero zero and one one state. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Another thing we can do is we can do a shots based simulation. So we can um, do our um, simulation as before, but we can instead probabilistically sample from our state vector. This is more in line with what happens uh, in a real quantum system where you have probabilistic measurements. Um, so I've added some uh, measurement, measurements onto the end of my circuit here. Oops, sorry. Uh, so now I can. Um, so I'm using this airbag noiseless airbag end simulator. Uh, so I can run this circuit for a thousand shots. All this means is I just execute my circuit one thousand times, and then I gather statistics about which uh, measurement outcomes are more or less probable. So I can get this result objects. Uh, result object, and then I can print out this um, dictionary here where the keys are the basis states and the values are the number of shots that landed in that uh, basis state. So from this, I can uh, um, deduce probabilities about what sort of state that I have. So you can see that, as we would expect, we're approximately 50 50 distribution. Um, in the zero zero and one one state, which is consistent with what we expect from measuring the the bell state. So this isn't exactly fifty fifty, as you're still sampling there. You're still flipping a coin uh, every time, uh, but this is um, this is what we expect. Um, and then I can. I can make this plot here, and you can see, yeah, this is just a graphical representation to show that I have 50-50 um, probability of measuring 0, 0, or 1, 1. So there's a lot of other gates that you can add to your circuit uh, through a ticket. Um, for instance, uh, you can add these parameterized gates. And so if you're doing one of these variational algorithms where you have these big parameterized circuits, you might want to do this. So you specify the parameter value first, then you specify the, the qubit the gate acts on. Um, you can also add additional less common gates through uh, this optype you know, here. So I can build the circuits where I can add a multi-controlled uh, X gate, a toppler gate uh, to uh, qubits 0, 1, and 2. Uh, so you can see uh, this in the diagram here. So this is this red gate, this multi-controlled uh, X. So if, if you're not uh, sure what this does, um, this applies a bit flip to the 
uh, to this qubit if both of these uh, control qubits are in the one state. Uh, so I'm I'm performing uh, an X operation conditional upon the values of two of my qubits. Uh, so all of the circuits we've considered so far are fairly trivial. So uh, perhaps we'd want to consider a more interesting circuit. Uh, so let's um, build a circuit for the quantum Fourier transform, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this is an important subroutine in many quantum algorithms. Uh, it shows up in Shor's algorithm and various approaches to quantum chemistry. Um, so mathematically, what this transformation is doing um, is this. Sorry. Uh, I apply this uh, unitary operator to my basis state. I perform this uh, transformation here. So um, I'm transforming from the computational basis to the Fourier basis. Um, if you're familiar with the classical discrete Fourier transform, this is almost exactly the same mathematical uh, um, transformation, but it's just applied to a quantum state. So I have my input vector. Uh, and then I, um, what I get out is a, a large vector with, where the amplitudes are my Fourier coefficients. Uh, so I can implement this uh, circuit um, in, in, in ticket uh, fairly easily um, by just uh, adding a bunch of uh, single qubit gates and some uh, control gates um, here. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So here I'm going to build a three qubit circuit and add a Hadamard. I'll just draw the diagram actually. Um, so the circuit looks something like this. So um, yeah, so I apply, uh, you can see this kind of pattern that the circuit follows. So I apply a Hadamard to the first qubit. I then apply a controlled rotation to the first uh, qubit condition on the second. And then another control rotation. Then I jump to the next qubit and form another control rotation. So you can imagine this kind of pattern just repeats for larger instances of the quantum Fourier transform. Um, so say I want to generalize this um, this pattern and then just write a function which builds um, the n qubit Fourier transform. I can create a n qubit circuit here with this function. I can then iterate through my circuit and apply a Hadamard um, on every gate. And then I can, um, for every um, for every qubit, I can apply um, a number of CX gates that decreases by one when I jump to the next, uh, <coughs> sorry, a number of two qubit gates which decreases by one when I jump to the next qubit. So I have this counter here and then I subtract um, the value of this counter. So I'm just adding all of these uh, two qubit gates to my circuit. And finally, um, this is not that important, but this is just to make the, the mathematical operation seem nicer. I can just add uh, some swap gates uh, to the end of my circuit. So I'll have a swap between the first and the last qubit and the, the second qubit and the second to last qubit. And this is just a and a pattern that makes the, the unitary operation nicer. So if I wanted to build the QFT for the, uh, sorry, one second. For four qubits, um, I can just um, plug uh, the value of four into this function, and then I can draw my diagram, and then we have uh, the pattern that we expect. Okay, um, so like I said, uh, the quantum Fourier transform is an example of a subroutine. So it's uh, a part of your quantum uh, algorithm that will appear as like a block and, uh, in combination with other um, subroutines. So one thing that you might want to do is wrap um, is wrap up this uh, subroutine in a um, uh, in a box. Um, because if you just look at raw uh, quantum gates, it's often quite hard to tell what's going on. So I can build um, 
I can wrap the circuit I have above here up into a box, and then I can just um, append it uh, onto the end of my um, circuit like this. Sorry, second, let's just scroll down. Okay. Um, another thing that's uh, useful to do in a uh, ticket is to um, synthesize a circuit to perform a specified uh, unitary operation. So um, we can uh, just pass a ticket a NumPy array with the unitary operation we want to perform, and the ticket will automatically generate a circuit to implement uh, the whatever, whatever operation we specify. So for any um, for any operation up to three qubits, we can just automatically get um, get a circuit for any uh, valid quantum operation uh, that we want. So we can do this with the two qubit unitary box. Uh, we can just uh, pass a numpy array, like I said, um, and then we can add this uh, box to a circuit, and then we have something like this. So this. Um, this two qubit unitary uh, box uh, performs this um, fermionic swap gate. Um, this is just a, an example of a, a gate that I came up with earlier. So this is just the standard swap gate, but it introduces a minus sign uh, along with the swap. So it's um, similar to uh, fermions in physics. So, Perhaps this box isn't that informative, so we can like break the box down uh, with this decompose boxes operation, and then we can um, find out what's inside. So um, this circuit, um, this uh, unitary box is implemented in terms of these single qubit gates and these entangling TK2 gates. TK2 gates are just um, take its own internal representation, uh, but they are easily converted to more familiar gates that you might recognize. Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, the circuit box and the uh, unitary qubit box. What's the difference between them apart from the, the number of qubits? Okay, so um, the input to a circuit box is a circuit. So if you're a user and you want to wrap some circuit that you have up into a box and then add it to a diagram for like easier visual interpretation, uh, then that you can do that with circuit box. Um, a unitary box, uh, you pass it, um, you don't know the circuit in advance, and you pass it a uh, numpy array and it will automatically build the circuit for you. So let's do this. Yeah. Is anyone um, following along the notebooks on GitHub? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Let me know if there are any um, technical issues following along. Um, so another thing you might want to do is you might want to export circuits uh, from a different format. So one thing that's quite widely used is CASM, which is sort of a low-level specification language for quantum circuits. And that was introduced some years ago. So it's um, just a fairly uh, low level description uh, of the quantum gates in your circuit, similar to like an assembly language or something. So um, if I have a, a circuit saved as a chasm file, then I can just read this chasm file in and then generate a circuit from that. So I can do this here. I've got my chasm file here, and you can see that this is just a fairly bare bones representation of the circuit here. And then if I switch back here, I should have a nice circuit diagram for my important circuit. So, yeah, yes, this um, important circuit happens to be um, just a an, al an algorithm um, called phase estimation. So. I'm going to use this later on in the demo. So um, I won't, don't worry too much about the theory of what this does, but I just have a bunch of single qubit gates. And then I have a um, bunch of these controlled unitaries again, 
And then I have um, a quantum, an inverse quantum Fourier transform at, um, at the end here. So um, what this uh, does it allows me to um, uh, calculate uh, eigenvalues of some unitary operator to some chosen precision, but that's not going to be important in this talk. So I can analyze the circuit by asking ticket how many gates it has. So I can just um, use this n gates property of the circuit. And I find out that I have 21 gates in my circuit. And 11 of these gates are two qubit gates. So it's counting these swaps and these controlled unitaries. Um, two qubit, the number of two qubit gates uh, is maybe important to track if you're thinking about um, circuit optimization because um, at the level of physics, they introduce much more error than uh, single qubit gates. So this is perhaps a metric that you'd want to minimize if you wanted to run your quantum computations more reliably. Okay, uh, so that um, shows how to build circuits. Is there any further questions about that or can I get on to running um, experiments on simulators? Okay, seems everyone's okay. Um, so the, all of the simulations I've done so far have been uh, totally noiseless. Um, so the only source of error has been sort of the sampling error. Uh, but one thing I can do uh, as an alternative to um, scheduling real device time is use a simulator that has some physics-based noise model of a real device. So um, I can um, connect to this IBMQ emulator through uh, PyTicket's Qiskit extension. And I can then uh, construct a noise model that's based on this real device. Um, uh, IBM, oh, I think this should be a different one actually, but all right. Um, so this is um, connecting to the real five qubit uh, device. Uh, as, sorry, this is um, an emulator that uses uh, a noise model that's based on the parameters of the real place. So yeah, it takes a while to run this one. Yeah, I should say, if you're following along, um, I think you should be able to execute everything I've done so far, but um, to run uh, experiments on real devices or use this uh, noisy emulator, you'll need to configure your IBM credentials locally. So I've linked to some documentation on how to do that. Okay, looks like that's finished. Um, so here I've loaded in um, another phase estimation circuit. This one happens to be a bit bigger. Here I'm using um, five qubits uh, to estimate the phase. Um, so if I look at the connectivity of this uh, circuit, I have all possible uh, qubits interacting with one another as before, like I showed on my slides. Um, and if I look at um, the connectivity of the device that I'm targeting, I can see that I have this much sparser connectivity graph. Um, so this is this is what IBM Q Jakarta. Um, this is how the qubits are laid out in this sort of nearest neighbor topology again. So before I can run uh, my phase estimation circuit on this real device, I have to compile my circuit to uh, match the the constraints of the topology. So I can do this um, by using this get compiled circuit function um, and then just passing my circuit and I can specify an optimization level. So ticket will optimize your circuits by default, uh, but for illustration purposes, I've turned it off here. So um, we have uh, 136 CX gates. So you can see that uh, Compiling my circuit down into the native uh, gate set has really increased my gate count. So I've now got this really, really big circuit here that is too big to fit on the screen. Um, 
So I probably want to reduce the size of this before I run it on the real device, as it will be very noisy. So if I look at the connectivity graph of my compiled circuit after ticket has solved for the um, for the constraints, uh, then I will get um, then I will get this um, neater like uh, nearest neighbor interaction between my qubits. So what ticket has done is it's inserted uh, swap operations to exchange um, the information around. Uh, between uh, qubits so that all of my uh, constraints are satisfied. Do people have a fair idea of what these graphs mean? Is that is that clear or do you want me to go over that again? Okay. Is there a question? <clears throat> okay. Um, so now I can run uh, the circuit here by executing this um, command. And then I can draw a nice graph. So with phase estimation, um, this is just the detail of the algorithm that I won't cover that much. But um, the, the, if you like, right answer in phase estimation is encoded in a single uh, bit string. Um, so here is um, the expected bit string that encodes um, the correct answer um, that I'm looking for in my algorithm. Uh, and you can see all of these other um, contributions are just noise. So all of these are um, uh, introduced by um, the fact that the low level implementation of the circuit isn't accomplishing exactly what mathematically it's supposed to. Uh, but one thing I can do is I can specify a higher level of optimization um, and then Ticket will work harder to try and give me a shorter circuit, which hopefully has less errors accumulating. Uh, so you can see if I, um, I now have, I'm now down from um, over 130 gates to 52 uh, two qubit gates. So um, this optimized version uh, is much smaller um, than my original version. So you can see I've got this much stronger uh, signal for my correct answer. If you like, uh, I can get my um, correct answer with higher probability. I should say that this is not a very realistic experiment. These are, this is just a using a noisy simulator. So uh, this is just to illustrate uh, that a larger circuit tends to introduce more noise. Sorry. Yes? Maximum optimization level? Uh, yes, the maximum optimization level is two, and that is the default. Um, so um, Ticket uh, will perform, um, if you use optimization level two, Ticket will perform uh, pre-selected uh, sequence of optimizations based on the specific device that you're targeting. But Ticket also allows you to um, use your own optimization methods, which you write yourself. So you can either use the default settings for the specific device, or you can write your own optimization. Um, so one thing that Ticket was designed to be able to do easily was to swap between uh, different uh, devices and simulators. So um, you might have seen already that there's a lot of quantum software out there. And if you require a specific software to run um, to run uh, your circuits on real devices, this could uh, lead to a kind of vendor lock-in where you have to use all of um, IBM's tools to use IBM's devices or all of some other provider's tools to use their devices. So Ticket, is, uh, Ticket can like translate um, circuits to run on many different devices. Um, so it's supposed to be flexible and allow uh, researchers to uh, explore the different uh, trade-offs between uh, different types of quantum hardware. So uh, Ticket has this uh, very generic sort of backend interface, which just represents a connection to a real device or a simulator. So I can just swap out um, using like two or three lines of code, and then I'm just 
running the exact same circuit on a different um, device or a different simulator. So here I'm going to use one of Google's uh, CERC sampling simulators. Um, so this is just um, a bit different to the IBM simulators we've been using so far. And you can see that using the exact same code and just swapping out uh, these two lines here, I can just run uh, the same circuits I was doing before on a totally different uh, simulator. So this is the kind of thing that's designed to be fairly easy and take it. You can see that now my compiled circuit is in the different gate set, and that's because this um, simulator supports uh, these gates natively, these RZs and AZs, gates, as well as the CZ. Okay. So now I'm going to, um, so I've shown how to, if you like, use the default compilation, so the default settings for optimized new circuits, but I'm going to talk very briefly about um, um, how to like customize the optimization, if you like. So um, there's a lot, lot more to say on this that wouldn't fit in this talk, but um, I'll show a brief example. So I can load in this um, circuit as a chasm file. This is a um, circuit which um, is relevant for chemistry. So it's um, a chemical simulation of uh, diatomic hydrogen. Um, so I can load this uh, circuit in here. Uh, so you can see it looks like this. And it's also quite a large circuit. It has 150 gates in total. And 56 of these are these two qubit uh, CX gates here. So, yeah, I've got these interesting sort of ladder structures going on here. Um, so, one fairly generic optimization you can do in Ticket is called full people optimize. This is an optimization method that's designed to improve uh, the gate count of most circuits. Um, so what this will do is essentially traverse your circuit and um, cancel any redundant gate operations, but also try and um, essentially uh, synthesize optimal um, sub circuits within your circuit. So uh, I showed the unitary 2Q box earlier, and this can generate um, a way to implement an arbitrary 2 qubit operation. So this will essentially do that on different blocks of your circuit. And just apply some other very general purpose optimizations which are supposed to help in most cases. So I can import this from the PyTicket passes module. I then apply this as an in-place transformation to this uh, Jordan Wegner chemistry circuit. And I can look at my output. Second here. So you can see that now I've converted to Ticket's internal gate set again. So I'm in this TK1 CX gate set. And you can see I've really improved my gate count here. So I was started at 150 with 56 two qubit gates. And now I'm down at 46 in total, and 17 of these are two qubits. So I would still need to convert this away from the TK1 gate set before I run it on a real device. But you can, hopefully, you can see that this is a big improvement from. Um, optimizing my circuit. Another thing you might want to do is define what's called a rebase pass. So a rebase pass is just a transformation um, of your circuit into a gate set, which is supposed to be supported by a real device. So <laughs> IBM happens to use this uh, set of gates here. Uh, so this uh, Perly X gate and this uh, SX gate this RZ rotation and this controlled knot. Uh, the details of this are not that important, but I can use this auto rebase pass and then pass in my uh, gate set here as a parameter. And then I can apply that uh, to my circuit. And then oh, I forgot to draw the diagram. So if I draw So if I draw my circuit now, I see that I'm now in the, uh, the IBM gate set again after having optimized my circuit. 
So yeah, you can, um, there's a bunch of other uh, circuit transformations you can do in, in Ticket and you can sort of compose them together as you would like. So what you can do is you can uh, construct a sequence pass, which is a list of optimizations and then pass those in as a list. So I'll perform this full people optimize first and this IBM rebase and then just apply it to my circuit. And then I should get the same circuit. But I could replace these passes with anything and they would rewrite my circuit in whatever way I would like. Yes, so finally, I'm going to talk about um, working with other quantum software libraries. So as I said, uh, Ticket has, uh, if you like, joint functionality with other popular tools like Qiskit, Cirque, uh, Microsoft's QShark. And this allows uh, you to use Ticket's compilation features in conjunction with other tools. So if you want to do your machine learning in Penny Lane or Qiskit and then convert to Ticket, um, and use the benefits of both libraries, and you can do that fairly easily. So here, um, I can just import this one function here, um, ticket to Qiskit, and this is just a way to convert between two different circuit formats. So if I take this QFT circuit, which I built earlier, I can convert it to a Qiskit circuit by just um, applying this function to it. So, I can then just pass this into my function, and then I've got a Qiskit circuit. And there's also a function for going backwards as well. So you can translate back and forward between these uh, different um, software libraries, which is quite useful because, yeah, there's a lot of different software libraries out there. Um, so, yeah, you can do exactly the same thing with um, Google search, for instance. So there's an analogous function, TK to search which just takes a ticket circuit and converts it to a circ circuit. So um, I can just get my output in the same way by just passing my circuit into this function here. Um, so yeah, that just about wraps up all I have to say for this uh, section. Um, just as a summary, I've tried to give you some idea of the motivation behind uh, ticket, the problems it solves, uh, how to construct uh, different circuits with the various primitives we have available, running simulations on noiseless and noisy simulators. Um, the process is the same for targeting a real uh, device, uh, although we haven't run anything on a real device today, and um, also how to perform these uh, different circuit optimizations as well as working along with different other um, SDKs. So yeah, just as a reminder, you can install a ticket here like this. And we also have some useful links to the API documentation and the Jupyter Notebook examples. And yeah, yeah, you can visit our GitHub as well. Uh, so yeah, if you want to um, interact with us in GitHub or make issues or uh, pull requests, then you're welcome. Um, yeah, that just about wraps up everything I have to say for now. Um, are there any questions? No. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to hear you. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, so this um, just executes your circuit 1000 times and uh, then measures and samples on each repetition. And then from those from those simulations, you can gather statistics about um, the different uh, probabilities in your experiment. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, so you're, you're repeating your circuit 1000 times and collecting statistics because measurement in quantum mechanics is probabilistic so you want to repeat your circuit many times to get some kind of statistical confidence about uh, what your result is supposed to be uh, yes um so uh, yeah the emulators are designed to mimic the real device as closely as possible so they have the same gate set same connectivity Everything's the same except you're running it on a PC or on a server rather than 
using real device time. But yeah, it's supposed to mimic the real device. So on a real device, you would also repeat your circuit many times and try and get um, statistics about your uh, your measurement results. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to hear people at the back. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so are you talking about these graphs here? Okay, um, so yeah, it's useful to start here. So here I've got this, where's my circuit here? <laughs> One second. I'll just draw this so it's a bit clearer. So if I look at my circuit here, I've got all of these two qubit gates, which are interacting between uh, qubits here. Do you see that? So <laughs> this is quite a big circuit, but um, I think you'll I've got um, what this graph is supposed to represent is that I have two qubit gates acting between every pair of qubits in my circuit. Does that make sense? So this, this MP4 qubit is interacting with this SP qubit here. Um, and all of these qubits are talking to one another. So that is what is represented in this connectivity graph here. So this is what my how my circuit is connected. And then I can contrast that with how my device is connected. Um, so this is how the qubits are laid out on the real IBM device. And on my circuit, I have all of my qubits interacting with one another. So I need to insert some swap operations into my circuit to make my circuit valid before I can run it on the real device. So I then compile my circuit um, so that all of my gates are just assigned to specific nodes of the device and I only have uh, nearest neighbor interaction. And then I can see that um, now my the graph of my uh, qubits is now nearest neighbor only. Uh, so I don't have any more all of these qubits interacting together. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe someone else in the room can answer this question better, but yeah, we have, um, like, a product, um, uh, that extract uses uh, quantum real quantum computers to generate uh, generate verifiable randomness. Uh, but yeah, I don't work on that project. So perhaps Mark or someone else wants to answer. Yeah, it's like using a computer. Yeah, Anyone else got any questions before I wrap up for a while? Uh, yeah, the back. Um, so it's different depending on different uh, hardware platforms. So on superconducting devices, the qubits are fixed nodes in place. So you have to introduce swap gates to exchange the quantum information around between the qubits. Uh, you also need to translate into the native gate set of uh, IBM, for instance. Um, but this is different with, say, trapped ions because you can physically shuffle the ions around uh, 
uh, into different gate zones. Um, so uh, yeah, with iron traps, um, you the sort of swapping happens at a lower level um, than the circuit based level. Um, so yeah, you you if you're trying to map a circuit to a real device architecture where you have fixed nodes, you will need to add some swap gates uh, and also convert to the supported gate set of the real device. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Um, they are directed asynchronous. Yes. Directions are not shown in the graph. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm I'm confusing two things. Yes, these uh, these graphs here are, are undirected. I'm confusing um another thing. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, how does this uh, image is somewhat directed? Uh, that is like from 4.0 point, uh, 0 to the right to the, uh, the number of operations of the basic health or the uh, here, here the shown the image, right? Uh, what, uh, in, 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 in
Okay. Yeah, stop recording. Yeah, we can. I'll leave it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. I like that. Sorry? Oh, yeah. That was great. Yeah, I don't think it wasn't the first Friday. I was like, oh, I've got the start. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
All right, uh, everyone get to start again. Okay, so I'm not going to take up very much time with this section. This section is probably going to be much shorter, but I'm just going to talk briefly about an example of a well known quantum algorithm called Grover's algorithm. So, just as a reminder for my slides earlier, um, Grover's algorithm is an algorithm for unstructured search problems. Uh, so, it's got this quadratic advantage in theory. Um, 
versus classical um, search uh, strategies for this linear um, linear complexity. Uh, so the Keckwith Grover's algorithm is it requires this sort of black box sort of oracle function, and this is typically the thing that's hard to implement in practice, or is at least specific to your use case. Um, so basically, um, as I said before, you prepare a superposition of all of your states. Uh, so a superposition of all possible uh, answers to your problem. And then you apply this uh, oracle function, which marks uh, the states or um, the states that you're interested in with a minus sign. So it kind of flips the amplitude uh, of, of the state. Um, and then you apply this uh, diffusion operator, which you can kind of think is an inversion around the, the average uh, amplitude. So, um, yeah, you have this average line here, and then you can kind of invert around this line. And hopefully, if you repeat this, these two steps iteratively enough times, uh, you sort of amplify the probability of uh, measuring the state um, in your, uh, um, your, the state you're interested in. Uh, so I'm going to just briefly run through a Jupyter Notebook. Some of you might have already seen this on GitHub. Everyone see this okay? Yes, I think so. Um, so let's see. So I've I've kind of cheated a bit here, uh, and that's I've just used the trivial oracle from this paper. Uh, but yeah, using um, more more complicated oracles is sometimes challenging. You might get to explore some of these ideas in the hackathon as well as how do I implement Grover's algorithm for like a practical problem. Um, so um, if I, this paper here uh, just tells me um, the circuits I need to mark these different computational basis states. Um, so if I want to mark the 0011, I do this uh, kind of multi-control Z uh, with um, X's whenever I have a, whenever I have a one, whenever I have a zero, sorry. Um, and then, yeah, so it follows this pattern. So I have one one here. So I have one qubit, which I leave alone. And then I apply uh, sort of these Pauli X operations on either side. Uh, just to recap, this kind of multi controlled Z, um, um, if you know what the Z does, it does nothing to the zero state and uh, flips the sign of the one state. So it just applies like a relative phase uh, to, the, to your qubit. So um, uh, this multi-controlled Z will um, essentially uh, just apply a Z um, if all of these control qubits are equal to one. And so if this qubit is one, this qubit is one, this qubit is one, then I flip the sign of this target qubit here. Um, so I'm going to define a sort of helper function. This is kind of just a detail here. Uh, but I basically iterate through, um, it takes a bit string and I iterate through the bit string. And every time I find a, um, a zero in the bit string, then I tell, uh, then I add that qubit to a list here. So I'm basically storing a list of which qubits to apply this Pauli X operation to. Uh, so I'll use this when building my circuit. Um, now I need to just construct my overall uh, Oracle circuit. So basically I need to have a function that when I plug in these bit strings generates uh, the right circuit for me. And there's a full, I've only shown three here, but there's a full sort of table of all of the bit strings in this paper. Uh, for um, given that the Oracle is sort of application specific for uh, if you're wanting to solve a specific problem, the Oracle will depend on uh, what, you, what you're trying to do with Grover's algorithm. So yeah, these are in some sense trivial Oracles as they just mark uh, a, a given basis state. Um, so it's perhaps not the most um, realistic example. Uh, so I can build this Oracle circuit by just creating a, a circuit um, which, uh, the num where the number of qubits is just the length of my bit string. So you can see here that uh, for length four bit string, I've got four qubits. 
And then I use this helper function to, um, to help me uh, see which, where all my X gates are essentially. So I'm just uh, looking at where, uh, get, getting a list of all of the indices, the qubit indices in which to apply these, these X operations. And once I have that list, I can just use a for loop and then just apply um, an X operator to every, every qubit that uh, has one of those indices. And then I can add this uh, multi-controlled Z uh, operation. Um, so I uh, target my last qubit and condition all of the, um, I and all, use all the rest of the qubits as my condition. Uh, but then I can just return my uh, circuit as an output of the function. So now if I, oops, sorry. What's going on here? There we go. Uh, so define this and let's just check that the circuit looks as expected. So for um if I have the one zero one zero bit string, it will look something like this. Um, so yeah, I, I have a function which now builds my oracle for whatever bit string that I want to mark in my superposition. Um, this would be, yeah, as I say, harder if you've got some specific application in mind. Um, so the purpose of what we've done so far is to just prepare all of our states in a uniform superposition and mark the basis states that we're interested in with a minus sign. So we can try and verify that we've done a good job uh, by just using a state vector simulator to uh, see that um, our, uh, our quantum state has indeed got a minus sign in the right place. So we use this as air state backend simulator. Uh, we can just create a superposition of all of our states by just applying a Hadamard gate to every qubit and then appending a, um, this Oracle circuit we just built to, uh, to our circuit. One second. So yeah, so here, oops. Yeah, so our circuit looks something like this now, and this is supposed to mark the all zero basis state. And if we look at our state vector, the all zero basis state corresponds to the first entry in our state vector. So we can see that we've just got minus, uh, we can, we've got like uh, a quarter on every single, um, on every single uh, amplitude, except the, Amplitude corresponding to the all zero state, which is minus 0.25. So we have successfully flipped the, the amplitude. Um, now we're going to define this. Um, I'll show you again. We've got, oh, sorry. Um, slides change color. Um, so we're now we're going to do this Grover diffusion operator, this kind of thing that uh, inverts about the average of our amplitudes. Um, so this is actually the same for all bit strings. So whereas um, whereas the Oracle circuit will depend on the specific application you have in mind, this always has like the same structure. Um, so to do this, we create again, the circuit of the same size uh, with n qubits. And then we uh, have, a, um, we essentially want to implement uh, this operator here. So it's two times the outer product minus uh, the outer product of uh, zero, zero minus the identity. And then we've got Hadamard's on either side. So we can do this um, by first we add our Hadamard's and then we basically um, just add these um, X operators on the other side as well. And then we also have another one of these multi-controlled uh, Zs in the middle. So now that we've got that, let's just test that it works properly. Uh, so I can just do, uh, 
So our circuit looks something like this, right? So this is uh, unlike the Oracle, uh, where this is different depending on which bit string that you're interested in. This is just uh, a block that is the same because you're just inverting about the average of all of your your amplitudes. So now I can uh, put this all together um, by just uh, creating a function which just takes a bit string um, and a number of iterations. Uh, and then just builds a circuit to uh, implement Grover's algorithm for me because I have my my two ingredients. So um, I just um, create an n qubit circuit where n is the length of my bit string. I then prepare an initial superposition of all all of my states. I can then, um, because in Grover's algorithm, you're re repeating these two blocks iteratively. Um, to try and amplify your state, uh, we can um, we can like specify a number of iterations here as an argument to our function, and then uh, we can just add those two blocks uh, um, alternately as many times as we like. And finally, we can perform a measurement at the end of our circuit, and then just return our circuit as output. Um, so I'm not going to go into the theory of this, but um, there is like a formula for the optimal number of iterations, uh, optimal number of Grover iterations, which you can look up um, something like the floor of pi over four times the square root of n. And uh, there's a term in here for like multiple solutions as well. So you can like say mark multiple solutions in your, in your superposition and then uh, try and search for multiple solutions that you're interested in as well. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> let's see what our circuit looks like. Uh, <clears throat> throat> so I will pass in the bit string 1010 and I will do it for two iterations. Oops, sorry. Too. So, oops. so yeah, our circuit will look something like this. So it's a bit hard to see here, but this is our initial position. This is our article marking our state followed by this uh, um, inversion about the average that I talked about. So this diffusion operator. So then I just uh, have all these layers here. Um, so now I can define a function based on the formula I just mentioned, which you can look up, um, that calculates the optimal number of Grover iterations for my circuit. So. I've just set some global variables here where I specify the parameters of what I'm looking for so I can decide which, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, if I plug in um, the state 10011, um, I just plug my global variables into this formula and it tells me that the optimal number of Grover iterations uh, is three in my case. Um, so now I can simulate this circuit uh, locally just using this uh, shop space simulator I used in my earlier demo. Um, so to do this, I will have to compile my circuit down a bit because even this ideal simulator doesn't support these sort of larger multi controlled set operations. Uh, let's see now. And okay, so I've got quite a large circuit now. So uh, three Grover iterations gives me 468 states in total and 210 of those are CX states. So um, this, the, the blow up in the size of the circuit comes from the fact that breaking these multi-controlled Z operations down into 
single and two qubit gates is actually uh, leads to a big blow up in the size of your circuit. Uh, so for instance, like the, the three qubit Toffley gate takes uh, six two qubit gates to implement in a straightforward way. So you can imagine for, um, for a, a multi-controlled Z with three controls that you're going to have to use a lot of one two qubit gates to uh, implement that operator. Um, so now, uh, yes, I can now uh, plot my results and see if it's working as expected. So I was interested in finding um, the 10011 entry um, uh, in my supervision. So now I see that I've um, now I see that I've reached that with quite high probability. And, um, so this is just. Um, this is a pure noiseless simulation. So um, if there was noise here, then I would uh, my, um, this this graph would not be so nice. Uh, but you can see I've 912 of my 1,000 shots have landed in my the basis state that I'm interested in. Um, so yeah, um, one thing that you could try to do to build on this notebook is try and um, uh, do a noisy simulation and see how this larger gate count um, uh, makes makes your results worse um, by having uh, more error accumulate if you have some noise model. Um, I would also encourage you to try and uh, play around with this uh, this uh, Oracle circuit function here and try and find um, a more interesting way of encoding a search problem into this. Um, into this Grover's algorithm uh, framework here. Um, I think that wraps up the bulk of what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted this to um, to be an illustration of how to implement a basic algorithm. Um, so hopefully this is an interesting tutorial for you to work through and to improve on. It's pretty uh, basic, but yeah. Uh, are there any questions on what I've presented so far? Okay, um, so I think I've been asked to finish up by um, by 20 to 4, so um, I think I'm happy to finish up early if no one has any questions. Okay. Sorry? Um, yeah, so you would have to find some way, find some like Boolean function of like mapping your search problem into some, some, some basis state uh, that you're interested in. Uh, so yeah, it's the Oracle depends on the case that you're working on. So I've just taken this uh, from this uh, paper where these very basic oracles are implemented. But yeah, it's it's tricky to come up with an oracle for a specific problem in general. Oh, uh, is there, can you not find the paper? Oh, um, should be on GitHub, I think. Um, okay, I will I will share the link. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so, well, one. Um, so, you're asking why? Why is the last bet always the target? Oh, I'm asking what the syntax. Oh, okay. So, um, so the controls are these sort of gray blobs here. So, this gate checks if um, qubit. Um, zero is one or not, or uh, basically um, checks um, 
the individual states of all of these qubits here. So if it's just like with a control next gate, right? So um, yeah, the, the first three qubits in this case would be the controls. Yeah, so the the flip the the Z operation is just the 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 operation that flips the sign of the one basis state. So um, you flip the sign of your third qubit to only if all of these uh, other qubits are in the one state. And you do nothing otherwise. Uh, yeah. So, because of the subject, this can only ever work with fully connected qubits, right? But can you maybe um so you can actually do um multi-controlled zeds with non-fully connected qubits but you just have to first decompose your multi-controlled z into single and two qubit gates and then um insert swaps from there um right. to sort of exchange the in fact i can maybe show you the compiled circuit can i um Um, oh, compiled sort always happens with live demos. Yeah, so maybe this isn't that informative, but basically all of these, um, all of these multi-control Zs can be broken down into two qubit gates. Um, so then I can just use my usual uh, routine procedure to map this circuit to an architecture of my choice. Can generate the plot the same way generate uh yeah so underneath um so this is this is like what's actually running on the simulator right um so this is the circuit that i'm sending to my simulator to be processed and then it produces this plot i just didn't show this diagram before oh the the connectivity graph oh okay cool um yeah i think so um bear with me um, I note for this case that I haven't um, I haven't passed a noise model to this is just an ideal uh, simulator. So this specific simulator doesn't have connectivity, but I could use another simulator that did. So uh, if I show you the connectivity graph, um, none of these optimizations are done with connectivity in mind. Um, but if you replace this air back end, if you either give it a noise model with some graph, implicit in the noise model or um, a more realistic simulator, then you will see um, the, the some nearest neighbor only connectivity. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, still got a couple of minutes. Um, I'm happy to wrap up there though, if there's no more questions. Okay, um, thanks for your attention. Um, hope you got something <laughs> out of this. And I think your next lecture is on adiabatic <laughs> algorithms. So yeah, <laughs> enjoy. <laughs>
will bring you up and then the course will start in half an hour or something like this, okay? In the same room as this morning. See you later.